Hello gamers! Welcome back to the Game Shop's basement where the grumpy old GMs are working on GM Academy and the Loft Project. Largest online fantasy tabletop experience ever. So today we're going to talk about looking at your character's glorious future. So our picture today is, you know, somebody watching sand slip through the hourglass, watching the passage of time. So uh, this is kind of a, a feedback uh, discussion. Uh, yesterday I was discussing with uh, one of our players on Discord uh, who was talking, we were talking about some of the differences between um, a 5e philosophy of play uh, compared to an OSR philosophy of play. And uh, this gentleman was talking about, um, you know, uh, DMing for or just as a player dealing with other players who just have whole, literally whole novels worth of backstory before they're even first level. Um, and just how hard not only that is to deal with as a GM, but that is to deal with um, as, as a player because, you know, it, it kind of uh, lends itself to, to main character syndrome and, and, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, for instance, um, you know, a few months ago, uh, there was a, uh, uh, before we got into the, the loft project, before we kind of started putting together the, the tables we've got now. Now, the campaign's always been connected all the way back to 1987. So, you know, you know the loft campaign, it's not a new campaign because some people have been asking about that. No, this is continuous all the way back to 1987. Um, so I was always kind of doing that um, myself, but I was capping it with what I could serve myself. Now we've got other GMs involved and we're doing our Indiegogo and we're just bring it out like you know to the world you know kind of turning it into a as big as kind of like the MMO only it's tabletop but so there was a gentleman who joined our campaign a month or two ago and his character he had a backstory and in this backstory um, his character uh, a kobold had hung out in space spelljammer space with Corlin Lorethian, the head of the Elven Pantheon, for 10 years. And, you know, Corlin Lorethian had taken a liking to this little first-level kobold out in Spelljammer space for 10 years. Um, kind of had uh, this little kobold as, as a protege. Um, you know, this is all, you know, player-generated backstory. And uh, Corlin Lorethian had taught the uh, little kobold how to be a blade singer. And... Uh, you know, I, I remember when the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide came out for 5th edition, they kind of stuck to the original lore that blade singing is for elves. Uh, it's an elven thing. And then when the blade singer was rewritten for Tasha's, it kind of, at least they paid a nod to the elves and said, yeah, blade singing may have started with the elves, but it's spread beyond them by now. And I'm like, okay, that that's reasonable. Um, like my elves, though. Da-da-da-da, elf power. But anyway, uh... Yeah, I, I actually have player characters who run into combat, and that's their battle cry. But anyway, um, enough of my cheese. Um, back to the, the the backstory. So the um, uh, so the guy, you know, he kind of starts his first session, and um, we are doing the old, you know, a reprisal of the old adventure module, you know, B three Palace of the Silver Princess. And you might be like, well, wait a minute, John. It's like if this is a ongoing campaign with continuity, how can you recycle modules? Well, my old mentor, Ron Watson, said evil can always rise again. <laughs> Given enough time, you know, in, in Palace of the Silver Princess, uh, the big enemy is Auric of the Hundred Eyes. And Auric is a Lovecraftian, uh, eldritch horror, cosmic horror entity, you know, like of the Hundred Eyes, that's, that's like a clue. And uh, so there is kind of a long-term nemesis thing going on between the Kingdom of Haven and Arik of the Hundred Eyes. Uh, I mean, there's a, uh, there's a dragon in the story called Arik's Bane. You know, that's the dragon's name. So yeah, there's like a, a Superman versus Lex Luthor, Batman versus the Joker, long-term arc nemesis thing going on there. So, you know, Arik could always just try to take over Haven again. You know, so that module is actually kind of recyclable. So, and it's an excellent starter module. Anyway, don't want to get too distracted, but so it is important, though, to understand Arc of the Hundred Eyes because the uh, when Arc's curse fell on the Palace of the Silver Princess, um, most of the population 
because this is Lovecraftian Eldritch Horror stuff, most of the population just turned to stone. And, of course, you know, this is going to make the party paranoid as they go from room to room to room in the palace and they keep seeing these stone people. You know, they're going to be paranoid that there's a Medusa and stuff. Um, but, no, actually, it was it was Arik's curse. Now, if a DM wants to be really mean, on the, uh, on the second level Wandering Monster table, there is a Medusa. I've never whipped her out. But, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, if you really want to be mean. But the thing is, Arik of the Hundred Eyes, as an eldritch horror, he turned everybody to stone. And the, some of the people that didn't get turned to stone, they had worse stuff happen to them. Because, you know, if you're turned to stone and adventurers come along and solve the module and you haven't been smashed as a stone statue, then you're going to come back and you won't even have any memory of anything that happened. So actually getting turned to stone, as long as you get turned back, as long as the party wins, that's actually nicer than the other stuff that happened. Other people became undead. Other people became, you know, insane or just driven insane. Um, you know, the, the captain of the... Uh, there was a, a soldier who was jealous of the captain of the guard and in, in his regular life before he went insane. Then he goes insane and uh, his faithful dog becomes a wolf and uh, he ends up killing the captain of the guard, becomes the new captain of the guard, but of course all the guards are stoned, so he, he uh, commandeers some of Arik's orcs, uh, becomes the captain of the guard. It, it's just... Um, and, uh, you know, when, when the party comes upon the... Uh, uh, you know, his, his wolf that used to be a dog... Um, you know, usually somebody like a druid or a ranger, oh, I want a new pet, I'm going to befriend this wolf. And I'm like, there is something wrong with this wolf. <laughs> like, you know, as a druid or a ranger or whatever, with a mystical connection to nature, you can tell that there is something supernatural going on. This is not a normal wolf, you know. Um, in the original uh, rules as written of the story, it actually says, you know, animals are normally neutral because animals are just animals. They're following their instincts. They don't have alignments. But this one's chaotic evil because it's, it was created through Lovecraftian eldritch horror from a regular dog. And then when the wolf dies, it be, you know the corpse turns back into the body of a, of a dog. So we got this whole story going on here. Well, this little kobold guy comes in, player character, and he finds some kobolds that are... Um, he finds some kobolds that are, you know, worshippers of Arik of the Hundred Eyes. You know, and there is a room in the dungeon that is just filled with statues because Arik's servants had to, there were, the, the palace was so cluttered with statues that the servants had to like take these statues and drag them into a room and just stack them because otherwise you wouldn't have been able to even walk through the palace. They'd just be in the way all the time. And so, um, uh, you know, so there's, uh, so these kobolds, you know, if you think about what would have happened in the story before we got that far, those kobolds would have, um, been in, you know, dragging statues around and stacking statues up and stuff. They have seen the the dark cosmic horror majesty of Arik of the Hundred Eyes just take over an entire castle. And so this player character comes in, he sees, oh, they're kobolds. And he thinks with a few charisma rolls that he's going to convince those kobolds to join the party and become his followers. He is a first level kobold and he's traveling around with like elves and humans and stuff and he whips out his sword and does like a fancy little elven dance with it and he thinks because he made some high charisma rolls that i as the dm should suddenly have these kobolds change their entire belief system change their entire world view uh and just suddenly follow him and become good alignment and become his buddies and and as he starts accumulating a kobold tribe or clan at first level with just because you made a couple high charisma rolls, those kobolds are evil. They are cosmic horror Arik worshippers. They just have seen Arik's cosmic horror magic turn, you know, hundreds of people into stone. And then they were, you know, employed to, um, not employed like a paycheck, employed like used. They were used to drag these statues into a giant chamber because there were just too many statues. And you think you're going to literally dance into the room because you're Blade Singer, showing off all the stuff you've learned. There's a better, you know, this is literally, there's a better way to live. There are better ways to think. There are better ways to believe. Follow me. I am the little kobold that dan dances like an elf and runs around with 
uh, you know, humans and elves and I'm of good alignment and you can be happier, just be with me. And he makes these high charisma rolls and thinks that I'm supposed to have these little kobolds just change their, you know, change their whole worldview just for him. I don't think so. So yeah, he quit. You know, he, he just, you know, said, I don't think you're the DM for me. And I'm like, I agree. I don't think I'm the DM for you. Um, but uh, the thing is, oh, we're getting over 10 minutes now because I told the story. Okay. The thing is, the uh, your character's future, and the thing about this thought, this came from, you know, our Discord uh, player, Bullet. Uh, he's in Ivory Scimitars on Wednesday nights. Um, he said that people should be looking forward to their character's future, not their character's past. Because ahead in the future, especially in OSR, because they don't do it in 5e anymore, um, a druid can found their own druid grove. A thief can start their own thieves guild. A monk can start their own monastery. The cleric can go to a country that hasn't heard of their deity or their belief system before and start a new church or temple or something. The... Um, uh, a fighter can become a general or a baron or a warlord or a king. Um, you know, the uh, a magic user can build a tower somewhere, start attracting apprentices. Um, your character has a glorious future ahead. And I think that's one of the big differences between what we see a lot in the 5e philosophy, where the emphasis is your backstory, your backstory, your backstory. And in the OSR, the emphasis is your, is your character's future, where your character's going, what your character can accomplish. Um, it's 11 and a half minutes, but one more quick story to really drive this home. Uh, recently, uh, a couple months ago, um, there was some downtime where... Uh, party sat down and they wanted to do some role play. They wanted to kind of get to know each other in a an inn or a tavern. And they started to go into each other's backstories. And out of five people, five out of five people were all secretly royalty. But they decided they didn't like living under mommy and daddy's stifling rules. And so they ran away to become an adventurer. But they were secretly a prince or a princess. And... These people did not roll up their characters together with the knowledge like this, this overused and tired trope uh, was picked by all five of them. You know, not that you can't, I mean, it's a trope for a reason. It, it makes good stories, but it's overused. And uh, all five of them, five out of five, were all secretly, oh, you're secretly royalty too? Oh, you're secretly royalty too? And this happened in a tavern or an inn in our shared D&D multiverse here in, in, you know, that is now part of the Loft Project. So, um, you know, just, you know, uh, a, a minimalist a back, a minimalist backstory is necessary, but minimalist, minimalist. Like, the major emphasis, at least in an OSR philosophy, is the future, not the past. It's where your character's going, what your character's going to achieve. So... Anyway, there are 13 minutes in now. So with that thought, I will see you around the gaming table.